my name's Glyn Pooley and I'd like to talk about art. This time, my subject is... We're going to look at the Canadian Seven and Tom Thompson. Tom Thompson was the big influence on the Canadian Seven. He wasn't actually a group member because the group didn't start till the 19, 1920. But he knew a number of the members and you'll see from his work, he had such a large influence on them. So as you see, he was born in 1877 um, and unfortunately had quite a, a short life. Uh, he went out painting in the wilderness, well, northern Canada. It's primarily a Canadian group and uh, they're the foremost Canadian group of the 20th century. But on one of his canoe trips right at the end, unfortunately, he got lost or he died. And, uh, he died. So anyway, they got a uh, this kind of uh, career whereby he made about 400 oil sketches, which we'll look at now, a few of them, and about 50 large oil paintings. It wasn't a massive output, um, but the influence was the far reaching. Saying that his oil paintings, he was such a generous spirit, he used to just give them away to anyone that wanted them. Uh, and if they were lucky enough, uh, they got a piece of artistic gold because a few years ago, one of them sold for two and a half million Canadian dollars. <laughs> so make friends with a generous artist. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> so here he is on the left hand side and there's one of his little oil sketches, as is this. Put them in because they're so fresh. They're so immediate now he was what they known as a good woodsman you know outdoors person he met the canadian the other members of the mate canadian seven in uh working as a technical draftsman in a company called grip limited they were a commercial art company in toronto but tom thompson as i said was an outdoors person so he used to take these trips um, every summer and any break he had out north to uh, Toronto and to an area called the Algoma Park, which is a large um, uh, reserved park actually built in the 1890s. Massive size compared to what we've got in the UK, something like a thousand fifteen hundred kilometers, something like that, as a park, national park. So wonderful with lakes, etc. But he used to spend uh, weeks out there, all seasons. So this is an example of one of his oil sketches on a wooden panel, beechwood panel, which is something that he liked. Relatively small, eight foot, eight inches, sorry, by ten inches approximately. It enables him to it be portable and to, of course, get the, the the freshness in the work. You can see the picture has been painted on this kind of toned ground, which we see happen, will happen a number of times in their work. So it's just coming through. Here. And they use a different, few different color tones of ground as well. And then he's building up the, the layers, thinner layers at the background initially. You can see a few thinner elements of paint, slightly diluted oils. And then he works towards the more opaque and the bright, bright white as it develops. So this is the difference between, you know, his oil sketches and his finished paintings. Now, what you get because he absorbed himself so much in that landscape he studied the light and the freshness and the feeling of the place and its immediacy uh, the bigness of the countryside that was there and as time has developed the canadian seven have become like a national treasure in canada because they were kind of assert asserting canadian identity they were drawing a kind of visual map of what Canada could be seen to be uh, like. We'll see that a number of them had kind of European connections, you know, like first generation immigrants really into, into Canada and a lot of them coming from England, but you know, they, they stamped a kind of visual imagery on Canada that it hadn't had before the art world in Canada was very conservative with the center being kind of Toronto and it was Toronto where the Canadian seven evolved because of this connection of all coming together in this design 
Studio Clip Limited. What you get here, as you can see in his work, is, as I said, a beautiful steady of the light, but how he's using how he's using the colours are stunning as well. He would have been aware of, you know, the post-impressionists that they had in France, and maybe even, you know, the early movements in the early 20th century, like the Fauvists. But, you know, in terms of how they used expressive paint and expressive colours, but he didn't, most of the time, and most of the group, they didn't move too far into pure abstraction. Thompson did start to go that way now and again, as you will see, but mainly it was staying within what we could call figuration. You, we can identify what is happening in the, it's reflecting what our eye is seeing in the landscape. But design is really quite prominent. They were, as I said, part of this commercial design company that would have been intrigued and interested in Art, new, Art Nouveau, as well as the symbolist movement, which is you know, a flattening and a design and a patination in their work. And he shows this in this in his, in his kind of language. Because he's painting outside, though, it enables him to have a level of freedom. So you see a flattening of the surface, but we start to see a loosening of handling of the paint. And that was probably because of his, of his immediacy of the oil sketches. When he works them up here, you can see they become a little bit more contained and a bit more controlled, but still, you know, very beautiful. So when you're looking at, we just mentioned a little bit about our cool colors here. Uh, you've got this wonderful blue, you know, cobalt blue in the center, and then moving up to this cerulean blue at the top. When we start to heighten colors, as we said, we, we enable to give them some kind of balance put a little bit of earth colour, as you can see in the background there, and hinting up towards the trees. But his treatment of snow, which is a, just a wonderful reflection of the light in the areas there. So snow is not just white, as you can see. It's elements of blue, it's elements of beautiful lemon yellow, and these wonderful pinks, which come through um, as well. So observing all those kinds of colours in harmony is what enables the picture to kind of sing out. We've also got this wonderful into this greeny blue colour there as well, which is bordering on turquoise. But it kind of just when you've got a, like a subtle green and it's opposite this warm brown red as complementary that the picture starts to sing. Uh, the other thing of course you notice about it is the the dark line which is in there, that dark like a kind of Payne's grey enables the contrast ratio to expand out enough to uh, encompass all the kind of uh, levels of power that color and tone can bring. This is Tom going to the most abstract of his way of painting. You can see this on this sketch, the color of the ground, which is just the board behind, is that, that deep brown color there. And he's treating the, tree, the trees as a bank of trees as just abstract shapes, you know, in a kind of rhythmic, harmonious way. Analyzing their shapes and then bringing them further and further forward. Deceptively easy to do, but much easier to do if you're actually out in the landscape because you're trying to paint what you actually see in front of you, the essence of that color. The challenge is then simplifying it into the appropriate shape and then putting a, a, getting a nice design balance together so it kind of holds together and works. And because of his training and because of his design eye, he was able to, he's able to do that. And this is a painting, one of his Northern Light sketches. He was one of the only artists, well, yeah, mainly him, that painted night scenes. He painted about two dozen. They said that he would go out in his canoe and just lay in it through the night and just try and absorb the wonderful northern lights to say as you could see in front of him there and he used to stay out in like log cabins have his work out there start painting in the cabin run back out into the nights and try and remember what it would look like or back into the cabin with the light on and put a bit more onto his canvas or he'd paint it from memory and these small pictures like this a number of them were painted from on memory with the essence of what he's seeing. Uh, 
again, imagine a wonderful experience of being out there and being in that what was then the kind of wilderness and nature wrapped around you enough for you to be able to share the strength of it in an immediate way on the canvas like this. Uh, there's, we'll, we'll see that there's re, you know, a number of reasons why they went out into nature to do this. Um, they're beautiful, aren't they? The, the, yeah, the, there's so much colour and rhythm going on in a picture like this. Oh, autumn 1516, which became one of his more his productive period. He's a little bit like Van Gogh in a way. He, he didn't. He lived around about the same time then to life as Van Gogh. And he produced a lot of his work within a very short period. Nearly everything that, you know, is of substance was done within five years. And the larger paintings were all done within maybe in a year, which is staggering, really. But it shows that that old adage by Turner that, you know, when you come to start painting a picture, it's almost finished. So it takes you all your life to get to a particular point, And when you do, you can just let go and it's all going to come out. So there's always hope for us all, as Grandma Moses showed us. You can be painting in 85, 90 or whatever. It's all, uh, all going to happen. <laughs> he, when, you, when you start to really connect with your subject matter. So this looks quite complex, doesn't it? As a kind of composition, there's kind of, it, you can see that there's wonderful design structure to it. But the, there's two main areas to it. You've got the, the top part with the, all the verticals, and you've got this line running through the center, and it goes down diagonal to the right. So he's held the picture together in those two large areas. And then if you sort of half close your eyes or you imagine this in black and white, you see that the pictures then split into zones, you know, area zones. So you've got this kind of more muted area in the background there in terms of the emphasis on blues and cool colours running through there. And then as we move towards the front, then the oranges, they get richer and richer down to the bottom, the more red into it. And, oh, and then the red jumps forward into the centre, becomes even more saturated. And that kind of gives you an illusion of some some space, but the the overall impression is something which is uh, flattened a little bit like one of their influences, which would have been Japanese prints. Another influence we could say was Van Gogh as well. They're not dissimilar to Van Gogh's work in in places, and Van Gogh, as you know, was really interested in Japanese prints and prints and design and that kind of thing composition all come together in in tom thompson's work he likes this motif as you can see of the silver birches and pine trees and the, we'll see that the pine trees particularly became an iconic picture for, for tom thompson uh, but it's about it's about that lovely rhythm you know again the verticals the structure of the picture plane thirds this diagonal running down through the center from left to right see it's almost the same this one running down from left to right there and then the same here running down from left to right then all the verticals at the back was the main composition all the verticals running back there you start to see start to see the artist's handwriting uh, and then he draws our attention in with this tree which is kind of laying across in a slight raised diagonal. So the combination of verticals, horizontals, and diagonals adds the dynamism of the place, the height and juice of the colors, the, the oranges with the secretary colors, greens there, the beautiful red oranges, cool blues in the background. And we also saw this cerulean blue in this one here as well. We see it again in this one. So the handwriting of the artist is coming out, but it's rooted in what he's seeing before him. He's, he's, he's painting what he sees with his eyes, but he's also trying to paint what he feels with his heart. And this is what makes the Canadian Seven, the best of the Canadian Seven, stand out. And they're really trying to take on some of the philosophies of that particular time. One is theosophy which is about being able to totally 
be absorbed in nature to such a degree that you reach a heightened state of awareness and nature is seen as some kind of divine force that can kind of help or cleanse or expand one's mind and you try and get some of that across in a canvas as we know any one of us has been out on an expansive nature walk uh, nature is just absolutely awesome and to try and put it down onto a canvas is it seems a little futile in one way because of the, the scale and the size but there's something about the essence of it there's something about how it makes you feel the poetry of being in that place and this is what these artists were after trying to get something about how it made them feel inside what was the archetypal feeling they were relating to in that landscape and in their awareness and their understanding of canada at that particular time okay so isn't it interesting to see the the freshness of his panel pictures these sketches and then you know the finished picture it's beautiful but sometimes the finished picture loses a little bit of something they're just different here, you know, because of the freezing temperatures and everything, he'd have to work quickly. He'd have to be aware of what was changing all around him. But he captures it. He has, a, you know, a shorthand which enables that to happen. So, again, this is on the birch ply panel. So it's relatively light. It's relatively small. He can just draw out the main shapes, the main verticals. You can map in these thirds, like across there, a third down there, another third down the bottom there, to give it the structure. This is what he's kind of looking for. Then you can just put the sky in, in the background, and then work through the centre third, and then move towards putting some of these beautiful, thick areas of the expressive brush paint through the, through the foreground. Um, and then, of course, put the, the verticals in as he's building this up. So it's one of those things, the best way to understand a painting like this is to go out and do it with the similar kind of materials. But maybe if you like these kinds of pictures, and they are beautiful, to have a, an image of it, a copy of rep reproduction of it, a little bit near you, so it's a, it's a good reference point to, in, in your mind's eye. But when you're out in nature in this kind of way, it opens you up to such a in a, such a wonderful way that this these kind of can flow through you if you're as i said you're open to the experience of being in it now these became this is the 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 canadian pine the jack pine tree which he became an iconic motif for tom thompson and canadian art in general here uh, he gets a lovely feeling of the wind blowing through this tree they sometimes they call this the harp shape so it indicates the winds blowing through the harp and the music that the tree sings to you is in a picture like like this and it's all done with the kind of marks that he's using the rhythm of the marks the, the flattening design quality again which we said is a reference to art nouveau, nouveau work and then using our universal language that we talk about, you know, blues in the backgrounds, muted, receding, etc. The rhythm of the sea is there by the kind of marks he's putting on. And then as we move forward, we get this deep red colour underneath it. And this is painted on the red ground, you know, see this red ground running through there? Um, and this is almost like the life force of the earth underneath is there. And that lovely deep red, it's got the complementary of the deep, cool blue, uh, green there, so that they kind of sing out with each with each other. So all those things are kind of being pulled pulled together in it. So harp shape tree design, the earth of the sky underneath. This is an emotive feeling. That colour he's choosing as his ground there. How that is relating to the blue in the background, the coolness, which is giving us the illusion of extra space. It's a vast landscape. I'm pulling those elements together in this most dynamic of shapes, which is the diagonal, which is the rhythm of, of the painting as well. He apparently really struggled with this picture. He was never really entirely happy with the sky. The diagonals are there in the sky and there's movement in it. He just didn't feel it quite kind of settled in, into the, some kind of the whole of this uh, uh, unity of the rest of the painting. 
but in a way you know that struggle and maybe that that kind of concept of what happened of it not being quite complete is also makes it even more beautiful you know nothing is entirely perfect in 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 anything really so it kind of always gives us an opportunity to think of nature in that kind of way it is beautiful before us and we experience it in a moment at any particular time but it's how our mindset maybe is in our relationship with any moment in any particular nature um, in, in the, that transforms the experience sometimes it feels a little bit more complete than others but the immediate way he's working with his paint that enables us to experience it like that and then this is the iconic painting that has been reproduced in canada all over the place and is said that jack fine in 1617 this is when he really hit his stride I mean, he was just starting to you know pull together some larger canvases there was another artist in the group which we'll have a look at in a minute called uh, Lauren Harris. He wanted to try and give Canada this uh, unique art scene a uh, kind of opportunity for it to express its, some artists to express their language. He luckily he had some money behind him, so he set up the studio in Toronto and invited a number of artists from this design studio of Grip Limited to come and work there. It's known as the studio in Toronto. And Tom Thompson, as I said, was being a little bit different and a little bit kind of just before the formation of the group. Um, he came to the studio, but he didn't want to be in one of the rooms. As I said, he was a real outdoorsman. So he said, oh, you know, I'll, call, I'll be outside in the, in the forecourt in an old industrial room. So they, they converted an old industrial uh, room on the ground for him with an old wood fire and things like that. And uh, Tom would kind of work in, work in there. But he didn't really like going out in the days while he was there. So he would go for his, he'd work during the days, right the way through, and then he would go out for his walks in the nights where there were many people around. And that was during the winter, of course. He'd go back to Toronto during the winter. And then in the summer, yeah, he'd be off and out again. So it gives you a little bit of insight into the kind of character that he was. He was also seemed to be, seemed to be kind of, quite a shy, retiring a person as well. Although complex, very complex, took, took risks in lots of levels, in lots of ways in life. What was pushing himself, was challenging himself, also celebrating, you know, elements of the ruggedness of the landscape. And yeah, challenging himself, I suppose, is, is the way you could you could see it. It comes in and out in his work. Okay, so that's Tom Thompson, but we'll see how close some of these other artists are to his kind of work. So this is another artist now in in the group, one of the, another one of the founders, founded members. Uh, this is uh, J H James Edward Macdonald. James Edward Macdonald was born in 1873. This was 1932, something like that, and he was born in Durham in England. Uh, his mother was uh, English, and he had a Canadian father, William Macdonald, who was a, who was a cabinet maker. And they emigrated to Ontario, and he studied with John Ireland and a chap called Arthur Hemming. He took up the position um, as head designer um, at Grip Limited, and that's how, as I said, he met. Tom Thompson, but he also promoted a number of the artists to try to help them as well, and um, in a way try to get support for the for the artists to be able to develop their their language and their artistic, their pure painting side of their work, and they encourage them to do these trips out, to take these trips out, and see that as an integral part of feeding in to the design process as well. So when they're going out, and then sometimes these artists work together on their trips, when on the field trips together, you can see them, and now and again they work side by side, how they their kind of marks look similar, the colours they're using are, look, are looking similar, and the feeling is looking similar. It's interesting when you put McDonald next to Tom Thompson, very few of the artists reach Tom Thompson's 
purity of vision and expression and freedom and freshness but they do they're still you know wonderful artworks and the color balances and the, the design element of, is all there and you know we see that kind of linking but some some of the other artists look a little bit i don't know darker in comparison but there is there is a, you know one that has a different voice as we'll see in a second so again you know we can see the design structure in this picture the, we're looking for areas, you know, again, like there's a central area there. We see the diagonal dynamic quality of the sky movements. We get the idea of the wind blowing or quite strongly because of that diagonal. We get the focus of the red figure in the, in the center around a little fire there. Um, we see links in this kind of work with, you know, going back to even like John Constable, where his sketches that he made out the Stour Valley in the summer period. You know, they knew the work, obviously, John Constable and that. Um, so all these all these things just feed in feed into the work. Uh, you can see this impacted on this color, deep color ground again, which is this deep red, which enables the muted green to kind of uh, to sing out. You know, this almost identical things happening there with Tom Thompson and McDonald. So you can see how they're feeding off each other. And there's this lovely, beautiful picture by MacDonald, whereby, as I mentioned earlier, that they were kind of trying to assert a kind of idea, an idea and an ideal of what Canada is and could be, and trying to give it an identity, really. They said they had, these were first-generation immigrants, or they hadn't been, and some of the families hadn't been there that long, and every nearly always the art scene pointed either to the europeans um and one or two of these artists did study in europe or to america so by making pictures like this that kind of coalesced some of those contemporary ideas we brushed you know quickly mentioned art nouveau for example around about this time for this and Gorgan and post-impressionist, you can see influences there. By using the grand landscape that was there in front of them, that, that they were certain this is this is an important place, this is a special place, this has got something to, to offer. Because most times when we think of the visual arts and the grand scale, we're always thinking generally about places in Europe, aren't we? You know, most of the time. We're thinking of the great Renaissance paintings of Italy or the Spanish great artists or, you know, the French artists, etc. You don't generally think of the Canadian artists. You know? But these were trying to, these arts were trying to say, well, look, you know, we've got very valid subject matter here and we can show them and show the world that it's, it's beautiful and it's, it's worthy of painting. And one of the, one of the things which enabled that to happen was an, an, an exhibition that took place of Scandinavian art and they kind of the that approach and that kind of imagery that they've seen in Scandinavian art wasn't so dissimilar to the imagery they saw north of Ontario and moving up towards the Arctic Circle which they were able and if they were accessible they could paint it has a special kind of beauty so these kind of art paintings are statements along those lines the wonderful cloud formations, which is not is reminiscent of people like Edvard Munch. It's his abstract nature, the way that he paints his clouds and the colours of snow and things like that. There's also the Swedish artist Feistead as well, who paints beautiful snow themes. We did look at and you know the, the enormity of the structures and the mountains and the, the lakes and the trees are are all expressed in in these kinds of pictures. Okay, so the yeah, this is another wonderful one of the the, the scale of the place, the scudding clouds across the top third of the picture, the central third with pine trees stacked closely on top of each other, uh, and then this wonderful concentration and focus on the idea of this island of uh, spruce trees. One of the main uh, subject matters for the group, of course, 
were, were trees and trees as an iconic kind of subject and spiritual kind of strength go back for thousands of years fundamentally but as a kind of symbol they they kind of enable us to kind of expand our perception of of nature each tree has its when you study it each tree has its own personality each tree has a kind of quality that kind of enables you to have a relationship with it they have often most of them particularly the trees they're looking at here they have a lifespan much longer than us but it's also a lifespan that we can observe grow and see and develop not like a rock for example which we know has a lifespan longer than us but we don't really interact with it in a way that we see in it grow but can change in that respect but tree things like trees we do and to use that as an iconic motif and you can see how when a number of trees are together they create this living organism which is the landscape when we set ourselves in it and amongst it it wraps ourselves around it it kind of it, it uplifts us we all know about the, the value of trees in so many ways you know healing whatever they give us you know shelter from the wood etc you could go on and on and on they to have that as a kind of subject matter was going to be something which is universal so to put it on this special rocky island here and use it as almost like a crown or something specific to focus on is something which most audiences could kind of relate to in in a kind of magnificent way really so this island of of spruce there is is iconic sometimes you, you see these artists do their little drawings outside um, in pencil and then it's interesting to see how they kind of just draw us in front of them and then have to redesign it to kind of make sure it's got a really good composition um, and this is an example of that i i got an old book of this work and they had a couple of pictures of pencil drawings that arthur listmore this one had made and he had to really change his left hand side and move the the trees over a little bit this is something we do as artists to try and get the impact and the deep uh, feeling of the um, you know of the piece you know again arthur listmore who was an english canadian artist he was born in sheffield and he'd studied in in europe in antwerp and then worked his way over to canada to ontario and in the process i suppose he also was an official war artist a number of these artists were war artists first world war artists and it did have an impact on the group so it's worth mentioning because not only did it delay the formation of the group to 1920 because when the war broke out of course a number of the artists tried to sign up and they went off to fight and they came back in a couple of cases in a bit of a, bit of a mental mess but it also stopped tom thompson being part of the group as, as well so it had an impact in that but one of the healing ways that these artists healed themselves from the traumas of the war was to go out into nature and to make these kinds of paintings so we see how everything is interconnected and how everything is interdependent and you know everything needs everything else if you like in its structure to be created these the, most of the Canadian seven didn't paint many that many figures it was part of the oeuvre but you know it wasn't the emphasis the main emphasis was on elements of landscape but you can see one here by Ed, Edwin Holgate um, uh, he, he was born in Allendale in, uh, Allendale in Ontario in Canada so he's native of, of Canada saying that though his family moved to Jamaica but his father was an engineer um, but then he was sent to Toronto to go to school and then he, he his family returned from Jamaica and then he settled in Montreal and then they worked their way back over to Toronto again with the, the firm group and they made the connection with each other Edwin Holgate was, was also a, a war artist so you get to see in this picture some of the thing about the strength of what they call the woodsman 
and you start to see, you know, a, a number of number of the artists painted what we could see the lumberjack and the logging business that was going on uh, at that particular time, main industry. They were sending wood, of course, all over the world. But obviously there was deep connections between Canada and Britain as well. So a lot of it came to England. And but it shows you the kind of strength of these people. This is what it's supposed to show, the iconic strength of them building this perspective of a, a, a new colonized country, if you like. And that comes across in an image like this by Edwin. They're just wonderful, delightful pictures as well, aren't they? Uh, you know, this one by Franklin Carmichael. It just sings out, you know, he's one of the younger members of the, of the group. And the golden light of the marks hitting that silver birch tree are just stunning, you know. The yellows, the oranges, the blues, the complementaries, again, the vertical structure uh, there, but then that slight diagonal that we saw in Tom Thompson uh, is there. They often painted trees that were a combination of um, ones which are in good condition and ones were, were in not so good condition so it did reflect the landscape that was there some which were broken you know some which had been chopped down mm. the lumberjack the lumbering kind of industry a reflection of that but also their relationship with how nature is and that's why i mentioned the first world war element as well so the psychological state of some of these artists nature reflects all these kinds of things back to us it reflects back our internal state when we make these pictures, when we absorb ourselves in these places, which is wonderful in a way because it also cleanses us of anything, that, the debris that sometimes we carry around with us. And it can show us, you know, how wonderful life and its life force and its manifestations can be. So these images kind of celebrate that quality. As is in this one, you know, this one has a, got the wonderful expanse of the of the landscape with the mountains, the old Goma region, um, and the the lakes with a wonderful white light shining on it, illuminating it. Um, and then you see the trees in the foreground, which look as if the, they look like the sort of trees you saw in the First World War imagery, where they're kind of just being decimated in a way. So. There's a bit of that kind of narrative going on, but it just goes to show that nature is beautiful at, at, at times, and it also has another side to it as well. And it's how we treat nature that sometimes can enable it to express itself in a particular way. We know that the lumber, lumberjack and the lumbering business, logging business was pushed to extremes, you know, and it had to be eventually highly controlled because it was decimating a number of trees in particular areas. So all these things come into interplay when these artists are making these works. They're thinking about them. They're not just going out into the landscape, finding a spot, painting a pretty picture. Many, many, many artists do that, but they don't have the kind of uh, the longevity of some of these images then because these have other elements to them the multiple reading quality the things we're talking about at, at the moment here and it's to do with just being able to crystallize what you see before yourself in nature now this is a wonderful picture of kind of nature you know the energy of nature in this one isn't it by uh, Vali it kind of gives you the, the feeling that the wind is blowing like in anything out of us here. And the, the tree is standing up against all those elements. The, the, the sea, the lake is throwing all its full force towards it. The wind is throwing all its full force to it, but it's still standing there firm in amongst that. This is Frederick. Oh. Frederick Horseman Varley. <laughs> That's a name in it to conjure with. And he was born in Sheffield in England as, as well. 
Uh, and then he went to study in, in Europe, places like Antwerp, and then became an official war ars, artist along along the way before he managed to get to, to Canada. Um, so he'd had lots of experiences, you know, again. And this is what you feel. Some of these characters who were making these pa paintings, they must have been pretty tough physically to go out into these environments for weeks on end, living in log cabins and, you know, under, you know, temporary accommodation in all kinds of conditions, and then get their painting paraphernalia out in storms and all this kind of stuff, and then get these things down. So yeah, it takes a certain kind of character to, to do that. And you can see in this one that the vigorous nature of the brush marks uh, are there moving across the surface. And so that enables him to get that kind of the feeling of all these things that we're, we're talking about as well. Um, this, it's interesting that, you know, the same kind of colors are being used again, isn't it? Like this deep green and this deep red. Uh, to kind of, and so it was obviously a motif that they saw in the landscape, but you know the handling is is similar, like it is on the bottom with the design air, area, but it's slightly looser in Varley's work here. In a way, it may be even a little bit more painterly at times, with the way this stick paint is being put over the the ground surface. And then you've got a contrast with this one. He was a member of the, he was invited to be a member of the seven. Okay, we can see this is a, a, the snow scene and it's got elements of what we've been looking at previously. But it looks a little bit more contained, doesn't it? It looks a little bit more still. Uh, so, you know, this was painted by Lionel, Lionel Fitzgerald. Um, he was one of the only, he was the Canadian artist that was based in Western Canada, Canada, so different, different area. And he worked and painted mainly exclusively in the Manitoba area. Um, so as I said, he was invited to join the seven in 1932. The group itself as a core group mainly worked from 1920 to 1930. Although we will see the last picture we'll look at, though some of those artists carried on in the style right up until the 60s, which of course would put them totally out of line with what was happening in the 20th century. You know, to be painting this in 1931, from reading art history as we have done from the Western perspective, Western Europe, we'd be, you know, operating in surrealism now, wouldn't we? We'll be looking really in 1930, Salvador Dali and places and people like that. This is so different. From that perspective, it seems very conservative. But they're, it's beautiful pictures, but they're grounded in their place. You know? And some of the techniques that we saw Tom Thompson and the others were using are being used by this artist there. The, the painting technique is more conservative and it's more confined, it's very detailed, particularly in its finish, but the design qualities are very similar. You know, the, the verticals and the horizontals and some of the treatment of some of the snow as well, the coloration of it. Uh, so this is Doc Snyder's house. This is his, probably his most famous uh, uh, picture. And then we've got Frank H. Johnson, 1921. The fire ranger, you get a massive expanse of the of the landscape shining through the scale of it, the kind of things that went on out there. And imagine this ranger in the in the plane there, just trying to put out the go on, just monitor the landscape and the what was it, manage, you know, the uh, what kind of thing was happening, the fire, having the fires and the logs and checking that the loggers were doing what they're supposed to be doing, etc. But there's a, there's a, so there's, as well as in the landscape and the, and the grand perspective of the landscape, he's put in something modern, you know, machinery. They didn't paint machinery really that much generally. Some of the artists brought it in, but to actually include a plane in there, it gives the whole picture a kind of sense of scale and contrast as well to the wonderful structure of those clouds. Each of those clouds, again, the overall shape is on the diagonal, going from very broad at the top to thinner and thinner and thinner, but along the diagonal perspective. That gives a sense of dynamism, but also a sense 
of the um, the perspective uh, of the picture. So then we come to Lauren Harris. Uh, Lauren Harris was the artist who uh, had the resources in the group, and he really pushed for this uh, society of of artists and tried to put a bigger presence for them. Set up that studio, as I said, and tried to help them financially. Put them in contact with people who would commission their work and enable them to maybe take a, a year off work with Tom Thompson, you know, for example, to be able to, to concentrate on on painting. But he was a great painter in his own right as well. He he loved the landscape. He loved the kind of art that was, these other artists were producing. And he had a unique vision. What you see with his work is he really starts to simplify the shapes and emphasize the design quality it becomes almost what we call metaphysical or transcendent that spirit and that spirit of nature really comes through so in this picture as you can see wonderful colors again wonderful design structures um very careful observation of tone and tonal ranges to make sure that you get that sense of balance a flattening off of the picture plane so it's uh, we can, so we can see the design quality emphasized but still a sense of light coming in and then he creates these kinds of works which these are bigger paintings now so scale is something which is ch ch changes maybe these are three foot or four foot square and he interprets the sense of the landscape they definitely show a sense of design and editing and a level of simplicity but there's very subtle transitions of shading and tone you can see like in the light areas coming down here how just the horizontals on the water go from very pale slightly darker slightly darker until you move into this transition tones like in front of it um, they carefully observe from being out in nature they're not just a total inner construction but they are a combination of the two um, and there's almost like iconography in them as well you know we talked about their link with the theosophy movement of the transcend nature transcendental nature of being out in vast landscapes and the beauty there so you get this cloud figure there it almost looks like a dove or a bird the wing so you imagine a wing and there's the, the body of the bird and the head and maybe another wing there you get the light shining down from the clouds and you know iconic divine kind of way um, that you would see in old master paintings for example and the symbol of the three shafts of light which would be related to the trinity and you know the light etc um, so this linking between the vastness of the sky the wondrous nature of the, the water and the lake the symbolic mountains in the center and in the foreground this became the kind of language for lauren harris but they kind of uh, they're really really noticeable once you've seen them and with a almost human quality but on a vast scale wrapping itself around the mountains there but still a sense of big movement yet the mountains feel as if they're thrusting up into into the sky in a way this does look a little bit more in, can, in kind of harmony with the surrealist movement the way they sometimes painted their works i'm thinking of artists like de Chirico, where they simplify forms down and make sure that the contrast ratio is large enough to give you a kind of insight into some inner world an inner feeling and that's what his emphasis is here, is here really it's how it made him feel but it's taken from what he's, he's seen before his eyes and he's just pared it all down into shape, tone and uh, colour. So it disappears into a vastness, a vast distance there. And then this tree, of course, penetrates up from the centre of the picture. So there's lots of icon, an icon imagery that you can read into that. Lauren Harris also went up an ice blocks there makes you want to shiver it feels like feels like that but to be able to get all that kind of information into these uh, shapes and forms only comes from deep connection 
of the land. But look at the subtle colours in it, you know, these wonderful blues, paints grey, indigo, but the tiniest bit of green hinted at and in the water as well. Moving up as we go further up into the wonderful greys, with it then move towards this hint of red, cool red in it, again, which is what we said right at the beginning in a subtle way, contrast of complementaries, colours, etc., but subdued the emphasis on designs experience of working in Europe to the group but you see he's just honed in on a symbol of, of Canada the red maple and just taking the iconography that we've looked at the vast river which is moving and flowing that's got an animate quality the elements of the tree which is vertical standing in front of it we've got some rocks in front of that which is about substance and something enduring uh, so he's got all those kinds of motifs in his picture that the other artists can kind of work with. And then this is him, same artist, working later. And you can see on now it's, he's taken on links with everyone from Lauren that we just looked at, Lauren Harris, right through to the kind of marks that, you know, that we saw with Hans Johnson and even Lionel Fitzgerald there, you know, that. There's a refinement going on in, in the work. And, and some of the artists produce their best work at the beginning, others maybe later later on. But with people, the ones which lived a little bit longer, they, as they got went on, they became like so established with the state and they had their, their reputations made and everything. Sometimes their work got a little bit less strong. But in this picture, He's, he's, he's questioning, you know, this is a radium mine, so he's questioning how industry is affecting the, their, their wonderful landscape. Um, he's just an icon, iconography of the, of the light reflecting on it. But he's got amazing space again, and the colour and the light which comes from observing that place. Okay, and this one just shows you how the picture's put together with the structure in terms of the mapping out um, of the landscape down into sort of shape and form. And the rhythm of the marks and the rhythm of the shapes come through. Interesting observation of certain kind of colours, the pinks and those specific kinds of greens again. What we see in that landscape in the later one there, again with the structures running through. I'm just quickly going through the last couple now. This is a, a sketch version out there towards Quebec. Uh, when they got the sketch, like you see, it's just got... I don't know, you almost feel the snow is in the paint, which is really lovely. And the, the wind is, is affecting the movement of the brush and things like that. That's what you get when you paint outside the element of freedom. You have to leave broken marks. So you have to be aware of your ground underneath. And you've got to trust the ground colour is the right kind of colour, which you've taken from the landscape that you, that's in front of you. And you can work with it and it enables it to kind of live if any more sometimes they the sketches the smaller ones breathe more than the big paintings and then we'll finish on this one by aj carson they said this is the style being worked and used now we've seen the motifs and by the trees in the on the island and the dramatic sky and then the lake and the rocks this is 1965 now so it's a lot later but it's a beautiful picture it's, it's a summation again of all those icons iconic images and symbols that we we've kind of looked at as well as the, the sky having its own personality there and its unification with the trees and the design there's a lovely way he's looked at the, the reflections in the in the water there you can see how they just kind of echo what's above them mirroring of course and then that is just broken up with a shaft of horizontal light to give that sense of perspective cutting through it and as we move towards the front that tone is just slightly darkened but the marks and the rhythm of the marks in the in the foreground there contrast the stillness of the, the reflection the reflected area so like we said before if we want light in a picture we have darkness you know that enables that to kind of happen if we want stillness we can contrast it with movement so multiple lines multiple shapes 
when you know they they offer a wonderful counterpoint to stillness and flatness and, and solid uh, depiction of a particular part of the space it's about contrast mm. so there we go the canadian seven and tom thompson if you like this video don't forget to subscribe and click the bell notification